Welcome back to Teach Amanda Fish Channel. In today's video, we're going to be making homemade white oak lump charcoal. I'm really excited about this. It's a money saver, it's just a fun project, and the product that you make yourself is better than anything you get from the store. Let's go ahead and get started. Please excuse my drawing. I don't pretend to be an artist, but this is just a quick rendition to show you how this setup is on the inside. I won't get too wrapped around the axle explaining the science of pyrolysis. However, this is what's used to make charcoal as well as biochar. This retort kiln that this design that I picked up actually came from a farmer who makes biochar for his fields. One of the first steps is selecting your feedstock. My favorite wood to smoke with is actually white oak. It's a mild flavor, not as much as your hickory woods. However, you can go even more mild by doing this with fruit tree branches, maybe some of the trim from that. You may want to remove the exterior. This wood was really, really old, about two years on the ground in a forest, and it had kind of a punky exterior and I like to remove the bark as well. I don't think it adds much to the flavor, and as a matter of fact, I think it adds a bit of a bitter flavor in the smoke. You want to make certain that that wood is as dry as can be because when it goes into the interior portion of the kiln, the first thing to come out is water vapor or steam, and that's what slows down the process the most. First thing you're going to want to do is get two barrels, a 55-gallon drum and a 30-gallon drum, both with lids, they'll nest inside each other. In the 30 gallon drum, cut holes in the bottom. The purpose of those holes is for your interior where the wood is sitting, where the coal is made, the gas escapes out of the bottom of the barrel while not allowing oxygen to get into that center barrel. I'll put a link to the gear and equipment we use in this video. A plasma cutter is indispensable and you would be amazed at how cheap they've become at this point. Next up, cut a ring of holes around the top of the 55 gallon drum. Those holes will become the area where the second burn occurs before the smoke comes out of the chimney and pretty much just keeps your neighborhood from being smoked out. These next holes that you put at the bottom of the 55 gallon drum are the ones that you're going to have to tinker with, both in size and how many are in there. This is what feeds the overall burning process. You have to have a chimney on the entire retort kiln in order to get a proper ventilation or flow of makeup air, the final burn, and for it all to flow upward, keeping the heat burning slowly down around the interior. We'll talk more about that later. I don't attach the stack. I use those tabs to hold it on as well as some bricks. Easier for storage and disassembly and you're not wrangling with that chimney hanging off the top. Next, you want to nest that 30 gallon drum in and place it directly on the bottom. Don't put any gap in between there because where that drum lip on the bottom is resting on the bottom of the 55 gallon drum prevents oxygen from getting into the inner portion of your kiln and causing the wood to burn. That would prevent the pyrolysis effect. Take your dried oak chunks and the smaller the better or the better this process works. If your chunks are too large, they won't convert to charcoal in the inner portion of the drum. Just remember that, smaller the better. As a matter of fact, branches work really well too. The more air pockets you have in, the better off it is. You've got to remember that heat is trying to permeate throughout that entire inner chamber, and I've packed it too tightly sometimes, and it results in having to do multiple runs in order to get it all to turn into charcoal. Put on your lid, then seal it up. Sometimes I use a brick. This first time running this one, I have a ring that works, so that's what I put on. You just want to make sure that that lid is tight. If your lid has a rubber ring, remove it. Otherwise, it will make kind of a, a burned rubber smell or odor in your charcoal. Your next task will be to find thin and narrow wood to put around the outside of the drum. This is what provides the heat. 
I've actually used pallets is one of my favorite bits to use. You can find those just about anywhere you look where there's a retail establishment. I ask if I can use their pallets and even in Lowe's there's these staves that rest in between the wood. I ask if I can take those home. White pine works well or any of the scraps from that you have from splitting your wood, that's what you can use. It's time to get down to the nitty gritty. Let's get the fires going. You'll be amazed at how quick the heat builds up. Don't be surprised if it's a little frustrating getting your fire going on top of your drum. When that lid goes on, you put the chimney on and the draw starts to happen. That little burn area on top of the 30 gallon drum happens really fast. In this video, I actually caught when it switches over from an inefficient burn and all that carbon and smoke coming out to a clear burn. Basically, when it looks like this, you're down to water and carbon dioxide. This process will take three or four hours to burn all the way through, and sometimes the smoke comes back as those VOCs and water vapor comes out of the inner chamber. It starts the retort portion of it, and the burn happens from the gases as opposed to the wood that you put around the outside. So it becomes self-feeding. It feeds its own heat from the escaping gases from the inner chamber. Good view of where you see that second burn happening at the top of the barrel. The smoke may come back when that water vapor is still coming out of the wood. For this batch, I actually had to run it twice. The wood chips were a bit thicker and it took a little bit longer to get the heat. So here we are the next morning, everything is died down and that's a critical step. No heat left in this unit because all of that wood there in the center wants to burn very quickly and readily. You don't want that to get any flame or any coals, embers left because all of that will burn down just the way it does when you go to use it on your grill. You know you've done it right and you've burned off all those gases when it kind of sounds like ceramics or maybe a metal tink to it. Always keep in mind that this is fire that you're working with here as a matter of fact it's kind of nice on these drizzly rainy days you don't have to worry about the fire spreading as you do the work when you look at the bottom of the barrels you'll see that creosote settled into the bottom it's almost like a tar a dried tar that's the bitter flavor leaving the wood and going up in smoke inside your retort kiln you may have some pieces towards the center that actually don't get all the way turned or converted into charcoal. They're very dry and they're still usable in, like if you have a offset smoker, it's fantastic for feeding that offset chamber. So Bearded Butcher Channel sent us over a couple of spices to try. I'm going to be using their Chipotle and Original on these chicken drumstick lollipops. Now that we've got that charcoal made, let's head out to the grill. We'll be using a Lodge Sportsman's Pro Grill. It's a cast iron grill, and we'll show you how that charcoal, that homemade charcoal, performs in the cooking. We've also got a dry brine ribeye. We're going to put some bearded butcher spice on that as well and see how that turns out over these coals. Now we're going to try on the steak, the Bearded Butcher Butter Blend and see how that does on this ribeye. And I'll tell you, these coals have a completely different odor that is actually, if you've ever traveled overseas, it smells more like their natural cooking fire because it is natural cooking fire. There's no chemicals in this. It's just natural wood, no clay, none of the additives that come with 
your typical other coals. Something else to make note of in your charcoal bags is what's called shrinkflation. They're reducing the size of these bags while still charging you the same amount or more. Remember when that used to be two 20 pound bags? Not anymore. That bearded butcher spice caramelized a little bit quicker than I like. The taste of it ended up being pretty good, but we decided to go ahead and make some steak bites as well and put that spice on afterwards and it was a bit better of a flavor for that spice blend. The Bearded Butcher sent this over as a gift for us to use. If you'd like to get that, you can hop over to their channel and check it out. Wait, wait, don't go anywhere. Let's move over to the lollipop. Since these coals can run a little bit hotter, I'm gonna do a little bit of indirect too. Spread that heat out some, use my cover, and put the chicken right in here. If you'd like to see more about how we make these lollipops and get them prepped up, Make a comment down below. Maybe we can work it into the video schedule. I love the new Lodge Sportsman's Pro Grill. It's just a great cooking platform and evolution of the classic old Lodge Sportsman's Grill. Now we're about an hour and 15 minutes later and these things turned out fantastic. Just look at the color in that. It's done a little bit more than I like, but mm. that smoky flavor and that bearded butcher spice is darn good too. We also went ahead and tried this in a skillet steak, a cast iron skillet steak. And instead of putting the spice on before the cook, we put it on after and made steak bites out of it. And that turned out pretty good too. So YouTube says that this video is perfect for your viewing habits. This is my latest upload, and over here is a playlist you might just enjoy. I hope you liked it. If you did, please click like, subscribe, share, and come on back for more.